Right. First task done tonight. The next one is we're going to do a quick poll for those who uh, haven't been here before. We like to be able to just do a quick poll to kind of see who out who is out here. Um, since we have folks on the Zoom, we're going to start the poll for them. But I'm going to read off the options for you guys to think about, and then afterwards I'll ask you guys to raise your hand. So the options are entrepreneur, wanting to start a venture, investor, marketer, designer, that could be graphic design, UX design, uh, software developer, and last is other. So those are your options. Think about them for a second, and I'm going to allow those online to start the poll real quick. Give them a minute for that. Looks like most of our in the last two holdouts are me. I don't understand why they allow the host to be a part of the polls. All right, cool. We got 100. Cool. We'll go ahead and end the poll there. Share the results. So, out of our audience here, we got 44% of them online as entrepreneurs. Which is really awesome. And then 56% of others. So we skipped the entire section of the option tonight online. <laughs> but for all those who others, I would be curious to see what we would have written. If you had an option, <laughs> bunch of different options there. Uh, so for those in the room who here is currently an entrepreneur themselves, all right, who's looking to start an adventure? Sweet. Hopefully you'll get inspired by those tonight. Um, quick, quick mention that there's going to be community announcements, like community networking afterwards. So you can chat with our presenters and pick their brains. Um, investors in the room. So we've got a couple. Marketers. Nice. Any designers in the room? Uh, software developers. Got a couple, and the rest will be others, I assume. All right, got a bunch of others. Cool. Awesome. Thank you for indulging us there. Um, again, the reason why we like to do that is just to be able to show um, what a diverse and varied community that we have. Uh, and I think that was always the core of this was to connect people who are interested in and want to support the local entrepreneur tech um, ecosystem. Uh, since I've taken over the hosting two years ago, which is crazy, um, during COVID, which was nuts too was I've tried to really make a focus beyond just the Ann Arbor ecosystem and just being, being able to showcase all the great uh, tech that's going on in the entire state of Michigan. So uh, so that's still something I hold really dear to my heart to kind of just show like everything that's going on in the entire state, uh, but really still focusing on the huge support system at home. Um, another great way to engage with the community is on the Slack. Uh, you can go, you can join the Slack it's at, you can go there by going to madeinatu.com backslash Slack. I will share that as well for, for folks, but it's a great place to kind of connect with people. Um, again, for those who aren't familiar, we're going to have um, three presenters tonight. I'm going to run through each one of them a little bit later. There's going to be about five minutes for each of them to present their, their startup. And after that, we'll do Q&A. Um, for those who are online, I'm going to read out your question for you for the presenters to respond to. And those in the room, uh, the presenters will repeat their questions so then those online can hear them. All right, so my part here is coming to a wrap. So uh, we just good for everybody since you're not here for me. Uh, we'll round out my part here by me thanking the sponsors, starting with A2 Geeks, uh, Roger Rails. Uh, Ann Arbor Spark and the Entrepreneurship Clinic at U of S Law School, and of course, Forum, who has graciously allowed us to uh, have this event here at Venue, which is a really great space. Um, so, with that said, let's go ahead and get into our great presentation tonight. So, we have three, as I said, we have APT, Wired Off Road, and Motors Wallet. Where I'm going to invite uh, Moch Saba. 
to come up on stage, our makeshift stage here from a APT. So APT Solar Solutions is a US spin-off focused on commercializing powerful and compact three-dimensional solar modules whose mission to unlock the power of the sun by revolutionizing solar power generation and distribution. So let's welcome uh, what you talk about to this today. Hello, everyone. Is this working? Hello. Yeah. Oh, it got it for a second. Hello. Eventually, it will work. You can hear me, and I hope that everyone else on the Zoom is going to also hear me. Uh, but yeah, I'm Mujtaba. I'm the founder of Adaptable Powerful Transformative Solar Solutions. And the idea behind the company is actually very simple. Uh, it's it's the concept that right now, the only thing you have access to in the market is what we call two-dimensional solar panels. And they're just flat solar panels that you see every day. And our solution is... Okay, perfect. So yeah, um, our solution is what we call three-dimensional solar module. And instead of having this flat solar panel, um, we shrink the structure into a very small footprint structure. Yeah, you, you, you've got tight. You're supposed to stand over here. Okay, perfect. That way you can look at the screen and the camera will pick it up. Oh, awesome. Okay, so so yeah, the three dimensional solar module is the concept is that instead of having the solar cells um, sitting on, on next to each other on a flat panel, they're stacked on top of each other in a very three-dimensional structure that has a 360-degree view on like a typical flat panel that has to face the sun in order to generate maximum power. In addition, um, having that transparent column around the structure is allowing us to uh, completely avoid any additional wind load. So our structure does not have to deal with, um, um, it deals with minimal, minimal wind load. And I'll show you how this architecture all of a sudden is going to enable many uh, types of um, um, products that weren't possible before. And all of the technologies are patented at the at the university. And this is not working. Maybe I'm not pushing the red right button. It's not working for me. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. Yes. Oh, wow. That's great. That's great. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. Um, so, yeah. So, what you're used to today is what we call solar farms. Practically, these are just massive deployments of the flat solar panel. Um, that I will not go really into the details. I only uh, point out that one little corner down there where you have to purchase a huge real estate in order to cover it entirely with solar panels. And that's what we call solar farm. And because of the scale, it means that you can't really be inside cities. You cannot, you cannot even be close to cities where the energy is going to be used because of the large real estate, it's not affordable. And therefore we keep moving away from the cities and create these centralized uh, power plants where you now have to get the electricity back on the grid to bring it to, to cities where they're going to be used. And by doing so, you're losing 40 to 60% of the um, generated electricity. So the way you're tackling this, okay, perfect. The way we're tackling this is what we call a solar force because instead of collecting light horizontally, we collect light vertically. So um, where you saw that centralized solar farm now, think of it as us not needing any real estate because we're taking advantage of all of the dead space that we already have inside cities. So we can create our own um, grid because not only do we generate electricity um, on these holes, but also it's it's also the same distribution path as well. And that allows us to, for the first time, create what we call decentralized power plants, which you can take in the cities exactly where, where the distribution and consumption of electricity is, so you don't have to do any, any electricity. Okay. 
they get you covered on we share depending on how you do the when people would join each college and then who messes up the day with it so sorry about that no worries I apologize for for the disruption. Okay, perfect. So, so yeah, um, after nearly 500 customers discovering interviews since 2018, um, we've done um, our first pilot last year, uh, thanks to um, grants from the city of Michigan and the National Science Foundation to show that the technology works. So in, in that corner, you see this prototype that was installed on campus, on North campus here in Ann Arbor that provided both um, lighting and AC and DC charging for electric scooters and, and so on and so forth. So for us, in our, uh, what you learned very early on is that in order to one day go after creating solar forests, which we're not trying to compete with solar farms, we're trying to augment that. In, in some ways, we're trying to expand the size of the pile because we can go places that solar farms can simply cannot go. So in order for us to get there, we have to really um, expand manufacturing and automate manufacturing for it to make economic sense. And, and what you learn is that in order for us to do that, we have to take additional steps in order to slowly increase manufacturing. So now what the e-chat market that we're focused on is called outdoor lighting. And this is simply um, allowing us to bring off-grid um, solar lighting to, to applications that um, simply could not have solar um, even be considered for those applications. And as you can see over time, um, the efficiency of the system is going to improve to the point where uh, by, by later um, uh, in, in the 2020s, we're going to be um, on par with wind turbines without any moving parts. Um, and that's really what, what we're able to do very, very soon. No. <laughs> okay, perfect. So now back to, to our beachhead market. Um, as I mentioned, the beachhead market is outdoor lighting. So on the left corner, you see what you can buy from Home Depot today. It has one little solar cell on the top, two batteries and two LEDs, and, and it generates just enough light. You, I'm sure you, all of you have seen these retrofit caps. You put it around your property just so you know where's the edge of the property so you don't fall off the deck. And that's really how much light it generates. Whereas in our system, we integrated our three-dimensional solar module into the body of the exact same post, not changing anything about the structure um, and keeping the footprint the same as well. And in that exact same footprint, we're generating 10 to 30 times more electricity, allowing us for the first time to generate what we call reliable electricity. And with 30 times more electricity, what you can do is that you can have a light that is 30 times brighter, or that in climates like um, our beloved Michigan, where you can have consecutive cloudy days, you can just simply go through those days with, without um, any concern. So that is what that means is that for the first time, we can uh, create the structures that are solar that do not have to compete with existing solar products because simply right now, they're all just degraded. Um, and that means that now we're going after the grid connected lights because for the first time we can actually provide reliable lighting. And the reason we can go after grid connected lights is that we provide a type of cost and safety time saving because of the fact that you don't have to bring cable to every installation site because that's very labor intensive. Um, that, that type of saving is allowing us to, to provide the solution um, for, for the lighting market. Excellent. So yeah, so finally, uh, very quickly, uh, this is what our roadmap looks like right now. We're putting together the business plan um, um, because um, early next year, we're going after our first round of uh, fundraising. Uh, we're also, we already deployed uh, 20 units um, in Northern Michigan for, for this winter to, to start the pilot. Um, and we already have customers for the next 100 units lined up. Um, to start pilot in 2023. Um, and this is all helping us inform the product development um, as, as we go through the design for manufacturing because we're looking at bringing our first product to market um, in next summer. So yeah, so this is this is the team. Um, we, we've really been uh, very lucky to have um, a lot of partners who have really helped with, with this project. And um, 
if we could go on more and that's yeah so I was asked to put one last chart in, in this presentation simply calling um, everyone to action. And I think at this stage, really what, what summons um, um, or sums up the presentation most is, is the fact that we're going after these, these pilots around the state uh, because um, they're really these wonderful pilot opportunities uh, where, where funding is provided to companies like ours to, to deploy our technology. And so, um, we're working with all sorts of municipalities in Northern Michigan, the UP and, and um, Southeast. So if, if any of you are connected with any businesses, municipalities or, or anything um, that are interested in getting involved with our pilots, um, uh, it, would be, it would be greatly appreciated. I have a few back, backup slides, simply just pictures of the different applications, uh, but I can stop there and, and answer any questions. Sorry, I'm way over time. Oh, no worries. That's part of it without uh, figuring out the specifics, but thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, so yeah, we'll open it up for our next five minutes for questions. But... Yes, please. How does the efficiency of these instances get at the end? And then you know, about maintenance, like yes, servicing these. Absolutely. So I repeat the question and then answer. Perfect. So the question is how does the efficiency of our uh, modules compare with flat solar panels? And then how do we compare when it comes to maintenance? Mm -hmm. So, one thing to point out is that all of the solar cells used in our system is off the shelf. So, the efficiency is identical to what you find in the market. Um, so, did I answer your first question? So in terms of the amount of electricity generated per cell is the same. Cost-wise? So Cost-wise the same, yes. And the fact of stacking them doesn't change uh, the efficiency? So that's actually for, for a uh, person expert in the art, that's counterintuitive because you expect shading for cells stacked on top of each other, but the wrong assumption is that the sun is overhead. But for most of the areas on earth, it's actually that's not the case. The only time you get sun overhead is um, at the in the middle of the summer in especially southern climate, you know, um, lower latitude. So this this vertical light collection throughout the day uh, captures a lot more light, therefore converting it to to more electricity by nearly thirty percent more per day. Yeah. What are your per unit costs now, and where do you project they'll be in the next class? That's that's a very good question. Um, I'll just answer. So, um, so yeah. So, in terms of cost comparison, for um, the fact that we are the first reliable solar lighting, it's given us a type of premium price that, especially for these early markets where we're still building up um, scale, we can have. Um, larger or, or more expensive units because we are setting some new standards for the solar industry. Um, and that's that's been one of the very interesting things to work on in terms of when you buy a solar product, the only quality it has is that it's waterproof. It doesn't tell you how long it lasts or, or anything else. Whereas we're setting some new standards for the industry for what type of um, um, luminescence you, you expect from it in terms of brightness of the light, duration of the lighting, and all of them. So that's where our small scale market. As we go above, um, along that staircase that I showed you for the different steps, um, that's when we're, with automated manufacturing, we're going to come in on par with existing solar panels. Um, but again, the goal is not to compete directly with solar panels. We're trying to, you know, just increase the size of the pipeline. Did I answer your question? I asked about the pre unit cost. I know you guys haven't ramped up manufacturing yet, so maybe you have some productions. Yeah, so because they're different products. Um, so if, if I were to answer your question with regards to every single product, um, that, that I can do. But uh, when I when you ask about the solar uh, module, that's a whole different market, different story. Okay. okay. So when it comes to our first product, which is the um, solar lighting units. Um, our systems are, are nearly um, six times brighter than what it is today, that the picture you saw in that right corner. Um, and the cost of the production of the unit is the same as what you find on the market. The, our final price is not going to be the same because we have that green premium to, uh -huh. to charge. Yeah. 
we have a question online. It might be similar to what you're asking now. So that's that's a great question. So one of the slides, if you could click that and go back to that um, three three charts, I believe. One more, one one more. No, it, it jumps over a few, three, but could you go two two more or one before that? Why did you move the table to the one after this? It's, it's not the uh, one, one after this. No, you're jumping over your Yeah, I don't know what I'm saying. Yeah. Anyway, so the, to answer that question, I had a number 83%. Um, and that really goes back to how we compare with grid connected products. Because in order for you to install a lighting system, for, for a installation new new project, you have to bring cable underground all the way to where the light unit is gone. And that is 83% of the project cost. Hardware itself is only 17%. So that's what you're trying to replace is that instead of you having to pay for all that labor, especially if, if you don't have access to power grid, just forget it. But if you do, that still costs a lot to bring electricity to side. So by, by the type of, cost comparison that we're looking at is that we're providing all of that upfront saving to the customer. So like you're like hundred bucks to these, like for example, just quick numbers. So just put a value like just starting out power there costs 50 bucks, but you're like it's hundred bucks without without accounting for the like savings and then install savings. Yeah that that power. Yes. So if you already have an existing grid, it's Electricity is dirt cheap, so you better go with something that's going to connect to the grid. This is great for off-grid solutions where you could bring a cable, but you don't have. It. Yeah, so that's that's really it narrows down the market into a very specific type of application. Yeah. Yeah, I have one more question. Yes. On your uh, market, excuse me, market opportunity slide. Uh, with the six different steps, you then had a bottom section that was uh, watts per foot, and that increased from like 10 or something to a lot of that, like 29. Yes. What What is that? Is that, uh, the, does that directly correlate to different steps? Because at step six, I'm serving really small devices. Is that just the efficiency gains that you expect to see over time? To yeah. Know? So right now, the solar cells that we're using for the first products, um, I didn't repeat the question. So what, what did the numbers on, on my chart, my um, stair chart meant uh, when it said power over height? So that, that was the question. So the answer to that question is that for, for the lighting units, the solar cells that you're using are only 8% efficiency because they're off the shelf, they're very cheap and widely accessible because we're trying to bring the product to market very quickly. As we go up that chain, we're going to use higher quality solar cells, which are still in the market. So the typical efficiency of a solar cell in the market right now is 22%. Whereas what you're using for early products is only eight. So, and the reason for that is that the markets that we're going after are not after efficiency because that only increases the cost of the unit. So as we go up, we're just using better cells that are already available. The only cells that requires more advancement was my final step, which is um, aligned with the projections of the National Renewable Energy. Now. So there's no technology or economic gain. Yeah, yeah, correct. It's it's already all available in the market. Yeah. Yes. With your stack cell technology that you have, why not put that directly in the light like for example, in the high yeah, just in the light of what you're already doing, it seems like to have it like in your picture, you have it going down the center, you need the eye. Why not throw it in the light? Bulb? Yes, that's that's actually a great question. So we call that type of system a hybrid system. So everything I showed you here are new products. We're also working on hybrid products where you exactly put these on the existing post um, because it's not enough light capture to power the entire highway light because it's super high power but it generates just enough electricity to to offset some of that um, carbon electricity do you guys have any kind of patents on your stacks so technology? that's most of the patents are just about the architecture yes 
So I think we're going to try and do without the clicker. Uh, I'm just going to just for the last few, I'll just take the slide for you. Uh, so thank you, everybody, for bearing with the technical issues. Um, all right, so I'm going to present, bring up our next presenter. Uh, we got Vincent here from Wired Off Road. Wired Off Road has developed the easiest EV conversion kit on the market, allowing dirt bike riders to make the switch to electric significantly more affordable. So, welcome Vincent here to the stage. Thanks, man. Hey everyone, my name is Vincent Pernicano and I am the co-founder of Wired Off-Road. At Wired Off-Road, we enable off-road enthusiasts to purchase the electric off-road dirt bike of their dreams for less by creating simple do-it-yourself conversion kits that transform old gasoline-powered dirt bikes to electric. Over the course of my life, I've seen a lot of people who get into a hobby and due to uh, financial reasons or time, they're unable to continue pursuing that hobby. Uh, the same thing almost happened to me. When I was 14 years old, I purchased my first dirt bike. Uh, I absolutely loved it. And at the age of 14, I had nothing but time and saved up allowance to spend on maintaining said dirt bike. Well, four years down the road, I had put some hours on the dirt bike and I was riding a trail with my family members and the bike suffered from a catastrophic engine failure. At the time, I didn't have any friends or family members who were experienced enough to help me put it back together. And so it sat for another three years. Over those three years, I attended the University of Michigan State uh, and earned my bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering. And soon after I graduated, I was re-inspired to rebuild the bike, only this time it was gonna be electric. So after a couple hundred hours of research and building and fabrication, I had achieved my goal of converting the dirt bike to electric. And let me tell you, it was incredible. And everybody who hopped on it was just so excited and enthralled at this brand new experience. Um, that I had to do something about it. But I realized that not everybody was as crazy as me to spend six months of their free time making it themselves. Uh, next slide. So I was fortunate enough to meet a great business partner, uh, David Kloiber, who has embarked on this journey with me over the past eight months of developing a brand new, uh, more affordable electric dirt bike. And we did this through the unique solution of a DIY conversion kit. Here you can see the hidden market that we tap into. Uh, we like to call this right here, the price to performance ratio. So currently customers are faced with two lousy options if they're looking to get on an electric dirt bike. They have brand new electric dirt bikes that go from 12 to $15,000, or they can buy a cheap imported electric dirt bike, which causes more issues than solutions. So here we come in, we provide customers with an unmatched price to performance ratio. So what that means is compared to other options on the market, for the money you spend, you're getting more performance with wired off-road compared to anything else. Um, next slide. Oh, I think maybe you, maybe you skip one. No, no, go one past that next. <laughs> okay. So currently we support one model for conversion and that is the Kawasaki KX85. There's approximately 15,000 of those dirt bikes in the United States. And our kits start from 3,000 and option up to 4,200, which gives us a total addressable market at the time being of $57 million. But we don't plan on stopping there. We're gonna continue developing more dirt bike kits in the time being. 
And then eventually we'll move on to on-road motorcycle conversions as well. And you can see our total addressable market continues, continues to grow. Um, in 2023, we anticipate to do roughly $100,000 in sales and to quickly grow to $500,000 in revenue in the year of 2024. Um, next slide, please. Uh, currently, we have bootstrapped the company all on our own, uh, and in order to expand at the rate that we want, we are actively looking into and considering outside money. Uh, currently, we only have one competitor in the United States. They're based out of California. They support two models for conversion, but their kits start $1,500 more expensive than ours, and our kit features enhanced styling, more durable components, and a longer lasting battery. Here you can see a picture of our bike on display at the 2022 auto show in Detroit, Michigan. And uh, our go-to-market strategy is very simple. We're gonna take this bike out to places that our customers are. So we're gonna be going to electric expos, dirt bike tracks, popular trailheads, and more. Essentially, the intention is to get as many people on this bike as possible so that they can experience the technology and the benefits firsthand. Uh, we need to expand our team. So currently right now, David and I's largest challenge is that there's only two of us. And there's only so many hours in the day for us to both promote this company and raise awareness as well as develop more kits so that there's more options available for our customers. So our call to action would be that if there's anybody in this room who can see and shares our vision for this product and what it can do for the market, um, or if there's anybody that you know, that you go ahead and have them contact us. Uh, they can email us at info at Wired Off Road. And if you're interested, if you're interested in experiencing the bike uh, for yourself, please contact us on our Instagram at Wired Off Road and we'll set up a test ride. Thank you very much. We're opening up for Q&A. Yeah, and I'll invite my uh, business partner, David, up here if he, uh, yeah, he's in fine. It strikes me that you can buy a uh, used and blown up uh, for bikes to be selling those also. Do you thought about that? Yeah, so if, if I got it right, the question was, um, instead of just going after people who already own bikes to convert them, why not um, have people go out and look through the used market for dirt bikes that are blown up or in bad shape and are being sold? Is that, is that right? Okay. You guys are company. Why not sell As a company, you can be selling rebuilt dirt bikes that you want. Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, again, you know, for the time being, I'd say the main limiting factor is is time and just that we would mainly be able to service this one local area. And that's, uh, you know, it's something that, you know, we have a couple of bikes built right now. If somebody did come to us and they wanted that fully built bike, we would definitely consider selling it to them. Um, and it's definitely an option moving forward as we get some more help, some employees that they could be, you know, continually building out bikes, selling them locally, or maybe in some neighboring states as well. And we've got, um, we're going to be working with a network of partners of like, say, home garage mechanics that are working on these vehicles. And so if they choose to do these conversions, they could go out and search for these and then we just end up selling them the kits and then they perform the conversions themselves. So that, that is an option right now for when we're kind of limited on, on labor. Kind of market since you guys got my kit. So there's $4,000 kits plus or minus a little bit. And what's the stuff somebody that has been doing your cheap stuff and doing the training, how does this sort of be the exact same kit from where you're having to buy all the components from? Yeah, so at present, our margins are around 30% at low volume, and that we project to go up to about 40% at 
at larger, you know, at, at larger volumes. Um, in terms of people producing this kit, you know, like you said, uh, somebody, you know, overseas producing the kit for less money. Um, everything about this kit screams quality. And when you go and you purchase something with the battery, there's a lot of considerations that need to be made. And a lot of the bad rap that the lithium ion battery community has right now stems from companies that are overseas that use subpar construction techniques. And ultimately, they are that imported bike that I was talking about. That's cheap, and it doesn't have any of the reliability characteristics that somebody's really looking for when it comes to an electric vehicle. So I would say the, the challenge there would be for somebody to produce something overseas that matches the, the level of performance and quality for the same price that we do. Question on live from Greg here. Um, any comments about charging standards? Yeah, so um, in terms of charging standards, I would say the, the main comment I can make there is that we provide a variety of chargers, uh, two of them. And, and I'm not sure if this is addressing his question exactly, but we have three different chargers, two of them plug into an ordinary uh, 110, 120 AC outlet in your home. And then we have a fast charger that can plug into something like a dryer outlet that's a 220, 240 outlet. Um, hopefully that answers his question. I know it's looking at my battery because I can only spend a little bit more on the electric, but of course, you need the battery to spend a little bit more on the battery in case it goes to the same point. You guys have uh, something that's in your charging system that you can plug in all the time to maintain the battery, or if it sits for years, it's not. Yeah, so with this battery, it's, and you said that was for a forklift? Yeah, uh, no, an Oh, an e foil? So it's basically a really quick easy to install it. So I'm not sure what the capacity of that battery is, but this battery, when it's in standby, only draws like two or three milliamps of current. And so at the capacity of this battery, if you were to leave it at a recommended storage value of 30 to 50%, you're looking at a couple of years before that battery would self-discharge to the point where it would no longer be able to be returned to a safe or operatable voltage. How long does it take to retrofit? Yeah, so the retro, uh, sorry, the yeah, doing the conversion itself, um, for someone that's more experienced, like us ourselves, one of us doing it by ourselves would probably take about four hours between uninstalling the gasoline components and then reinstalling our kit. For somebody who is maybe it's their first time, I would estimate 10 hours. Yeah, it's, it's very simple. Everything is uh, basic hand tools. There's actually only about 12 tools that are involved in this, which are just standard sockets, wrenches. Now I'm assuming you have a YouTube video you just send one and they just follow along. Whatever. Yeah, we have a simple installation video that people can follow along with. We give it, you know, we have a more of like a granular uh, take on it. And then one that's just an overarching view for maybe people who kind of get the memo. But really the, the vision with this kit was to make it as accessible to an ordinary consumer as possible. And in doing that, we eliminated all fabrication, welding or anything of that sort. It's completely bolted on. And going go back to the comment earlier, I want to mention about the white but you replicate that. Um, do you feel like this would be something where it's like more like a first to the market kind of win and maybe, you know, primary with a, I don't know anything about motor payment in the health industry, but like primary with a big company, collected loyalty, I'm going to manufacture quickly, scale much faster, and be the first to the market. You, know, you may not have something different that others can build, but you'll be the first to the market and at least have that brand. Have you thought about that? Yeah, definitely. And, you know, there's something to be said that there, there's only so many of these used bikes out there. And so if you've already taken up uh, the vast majority of the share for that particular model, um, it kind of blocks any competition from coming in that aspect. So, um, yeah, there's, there's, yeah. I think, I think we've, we've kind of been working very hard to establish ourselves in the electric bike motorcycle community. And so we really are building that name early, and um, we believe that that's going to hold a lot more value than somebody who comes in in a year or something. And we don't really anticipate like a, a Honda or Yamaha getting into this space because they want to sell brand new stuff. So we're not worried about a super big company. Um, 
we do anticipate there's going to be some competition coming in, but by that point, we think we will have created enough of a name of our, for ourselves on social media and, and all that, which we already have gotten quite a bit of traction. So we're, we're confident that we've got it covered as best we can. I think that's time for our questions here, but you know, obviously we're sticking around afterwards to answer any other questions we have. Thank both uh, David and Vincent here for sharing the wireline program. All right, so we're going to bring up our last presenter of the evening. Uh, we got Kat of Voters Wallet. The Voters Wallet is a crowdfunding platform making donating and raising money easy for your candidates and causes. So go ahead and bring uh, Kat up to the stage. You see me looking at my notes, no, you don't. I traveled the last day, so I'm excited to be here. There we go. All right. So, like you said, my name is Kat Hadley, uh, and I am the founder of Voters Wallet. Um, and really excited to be here tonight. So, we have a problem in America. Um, and that's that over half of the voters under the age of 40 said they were going to donate to a political campaign or a candidate, but they only 5% ended up actually doing so. You can go to the next slide, please. Um, and it's not because people aren't interested. This summer, we talked to over 100 of these younger voters uh, about why they weren't coming through with donating. Um, and it wasn't because there was a lack of interest, but they found things like actually setting aside a budget or the convenience to be getting in the way of actually doing that. And on the other side, politicians and uh, political insiders, they really want these people to be more involved, but it's really hard to actually make that connection. And when you're running a campaign, because a lot of my background is in campaign fundraising, you only have 24 hours. So you call the people that are gonna donate that you know will donate because that just makes more sense. So you can go to the next slide. So this is what Voters Wallet kind of aims to solve. So um, we are providing a lot of different features for folks. We're doing scan and go. So when you're at a protest or a rally, people can scan a QR code for your cause and donate right there on the spot. Um, but also people can find out more about local candidates um, and candidates that are standing up for the issues that they really care about and give to them on a recurring basis. Um, and the other feature that we have is a roundup feature similar to Acorns. You can connect your bank account, it'll round up uh, all your transactions during the month, and then you have a pool of money that you can donate to these campaigns or causes. So I'm going to go to the next slide. So we're a little different. Um, we're really lucky in that we're actually working with a lot of our largest competition at this point. Um, we're going to be integrated into a few different larger donating platforms. Um, but the roundup is really what sets us apart. We're not trying to necessarily gamify this system. Um, but we're going to try to focus on really just building out what already is there and getting these newer, younger voters integrated into the donating space. Um, we're also a one-stop shop for political donations, and that's for not only nonprofits that are working in that space and like the C3 space, but for those candidates so they can further champion those people. Um, next slide. Okay. Um, so... Our market, our market is focusing on these younger voters, obviously, um, but we are, because they're going to be our best early adapters. And so we're looking at the end of 2023, raising a, a fair amount of money um, and having it grow then, you know, here's basically what our plan is right now. We want to launch in Michigan this year. We're going to run a beta. We're going to perfect it. Then we're going to go into all the swing states. Um, the swing states are where they spend the bulk of election money. Um, they're winnable on either side. So you see a lot of action there. And then eventually we'd like to be a national movement. Um, and this is working with a bunch of different people and it's very ambitious, but it's uh, at least for 2023, it's only 10,000 users, which is a fair amount, but without really any advertising and just word of mouth, we already have a pretty large wait list going on. So we have about 200 people and this um, year, we're also launching a big social media campaign for the next one. Using some of our amazing partners, this list has grown. Um, obviously, unfortunately, Stacey Abrams didn't win, but she does run a really excellent nonprofit that we're going to be working with. Um, but we are very lucky to have these larger nonprofits um, and candidates that are going to be working with us 
to really get the word out um, and start getting these people more involved. And that will really help grow our user base. And the good news is that small the small donor pool has really continued to grow. So in the last 10 years, it went from about 50,000 people to 12 million in the last election cycle. Next slide. There's one, I might have ended there. Oh, okay, cool. Um, so about us, um, so I am a Truman Scholar. I'm also working with another really great Truman Scholar named Max Williamson, who is doing the programming for this. Um, and then we have locally, um, Jameson and Autumn, who are UX UI designers. And so that's our like small but mighty team. My background is in community organizing and political work. I'm also just got elected as your Ann Arbor Library trustee, so I'm very proud. Um, but yeah, um, I'm just really happy to be here and happy to answer any questions. So thanks for having me. So you sell your service to individual families. Oh yeah, I did forget how we make money, sorry. <laughs> so actually, so what we do, because um, there's a fair amount of reporting that has to happen when you make a political donation. Um, so uh, like you'll have these reports that you send in as a candidate um, and they're pretty labor intensive. So we have the tech in the background and we do charge basically 8% fee to use it for every donation. So instead of upfront paying a larger monthly fee for those smaller candidates like myself who ran, um, it would have been hard in the beginning to say I'm going to run and pay $50 a month for Act Blue um, or something like that. Um, I can just say, okay, you can take a small cut. Um, and the tech that's out there now also does charge a small cut, um, but it's on both sides. So we charge that 8% fee and that's how we're going to make money. Uh, question online from Rob. Uh, how do you compare to Venmo or Cash App? Sure. So um, that's a great question. So you cannot donate to a candidate. You can't actually like you can't give them money via Venmo. There's specific reporting that has to happen. So when you give a candidate money, you need to give them like your who you work for and your address. This information that goes on file because it's all public record. So one thing that we do is try to break that down for people when they're signing up, because a lot of people are like, well, why is this candidate asking for my boss's name? Which is a little weird, but um, yeah, so that's the difference. Um, so PayPal, you can, but they don't always demand the reporting. So on the campaign's end, if you give me $5 and six months from now, I have to make a report, I'm gonna have to track you down and be like, hey, where, where are you from? What is this information? I need this legally to file this report to be in good state. And you, there's also a lot of fees if you mess that up too as a candidate. So candidates are more likely to sign up for people that they know are tracking that information. Yeah. Yeah, just because this being um, popular, like, you know, once every two years or midterms or once every four years, or like is it going to be for any type of election that will allow like, like school will go in an election day? Yeah, we want to be year round. That's actually why we added um, some of the nonprofits, because I originally envisioned this as like, we're only going to do candidates. That's all we're doing. Um, and then I had a friend who was working um, in DC at Planned Parenthood, and she was like, hey, we would love to use this. And then, you know, Emily's list was like, hey, you guys are doing this. Let us know when you launch. Um, so there's demand there. And so, yeah, and I think that'll help us kind of keep our doors open at the same time. So we're not just only in these pockets time for running, but yeah, we plan to be open all the time. Uh, congratulations on your election. Uh, your, your revenue figures from a couple of slides ago said like 600 something K and then 11 million between 2024 and 2025. Mm -hmm. I thought that was really interesting because 2024 is an election year. Yeah. So I would actually think it's much higher, harder to grow revenue in 25. I'm, I'm curious like, what goes into that. Sure. Um, so one thing is just like the general expansion of being able to be nationwide with larger partners. Um, so that's that's a little bit of that. And then um, even in those off years, there's still some fundraising that happens. And the idea is that if we can get, we can really market ourselves as like there for those lower elections. So like getting all the city council people, um, getting those kind of people into our app, we can we can then kind of use that to boost when it's national next time. Um, and the swing states do make a lot of money, but it's only 12 states versus all of them. So um, that's why that number is there.
This would be in like a current check box as well on your app. So that yeah. yeah, yeah. And we're, yeah, we, we want to make it um, as accessible as possible because that was just the biggest thing. I think a lot of folks that are younger are used to just tap and go. So it does make sense that, you know, when you go up to a screen and it's like, we need a million pieces of information for one donation, um, that that might be a little confusing. And then also it's just finding people at the same time. But yeah, we're going to have recurring, we're going to have the round of transactions, and we're also going to offer one time. So people are like, hey, I just want to give them 20 bucks and not give them my, like, you know, not have to be tied to this forever. That's fine too. Seems like you almost need to start this by word, but you can somehow have it on this of other information to the red and you have a user base that's already there you know that's already entered there basically plugged into everything else and that might be your privacy is going to be the other yeah the five up people will create a lot of privacy yeah 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 um no a big thing a big thing is selling emails um which is a complicated I'm happy to talk after about who sells your email um not me I have zero interest I get the same emails they drive me up the wall um and I know the people that are writing these emails it makes it worse but um I think that you know privacy is a huge thing for me um and I think that we're trying to build something where people are coming back enough where they can have an account, have a standing account, know what it is, know how to use the search function, get involved in, in more ways. You know, there's things like once you donate, you can opt in to be in a supporter circle. And that means you're getting invited to like events and other things like that, because there's a lot of barriers to getting involved, even on a local level. So we're trying to kind of make that more open for people. We got one last question here from Rob. Uh, so it seems to me that the donor problem is complexity for the information sharing. Could you lower the bar of complexity on the donor by bundling these donors to kind of like trust instead of like large donor uh, fund? Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, so that would be a pack. Um, I don't know. I like so th there's a lot of legal stuff when it comes to political donations, um, but you cannot. You can donate to a PAC, but you don't donate anonymously to that PAC technically. There's like very specific things, unless it's a super PAC. But, you know, there was the idea of saying, you know, okay, we can help people better understand that. And we can also um, not necessarily donate for them on behalf of them, but um, help them say, okay, you know, if you and 10 of your friends want to make like the PAC to buy everyone in Ann Arbor the new Pokemon video game. Like you can make that, here are the steps to do that. You can still use our apps to do that, that kind of thing, but yeah. What was that? I think that's round on our question. Thank so you. That's all I'll congratulate her win, which is super cool. Uh, so yeah, so that's, uh, let's give another round for our three presenter tonight. Okay. Uh, we're going to move into our community announcement section. So if you got something that you want to share, whether it's a meetup that you want people to check out, if you're currently hiring or, or looking to uh, start a new venture yourself, uh, please come up here and uh, just share it um, as folks are maybe making their way up. And if those online want to share it on, on the Zoom, I'll read those out. I'll share that, uh, the, like I said earlier, that this is our last meetup for the year. Uh, so our next one will be on January 17th of 2023, which is weird to say out loud. And yeah, anybody? Yeah. 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 Uh, thanks, uh, thanks for the opportunity. My name is Ali. I actually, oh, sorry. My name is Ali. I attended the University of Michigan undergrad med school, and I'm an OBGYN and infertility doctor by training. And what I'm working on with my uh, business partner is really reinventing uh, women's reproductive health and infertility and doing it digitally. And, uh, you know, the reason I'm here today is to listen to all these great talks. It's wonderful. You guys did an amazing job. Um, also to, you know, to work and connect with people in the software development industry and learn more about um, ways to uh, not only develop it, but is there some sort of potential partnership where we can together develop this really novel um, software that we're working on 
um, to increase access to reproductive health for all women. So um, I hope to meet people not only in this session, but sessions to come. Hello. 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 Hey, everybody. My name is Lucky. I have an acupuncture clinic, and I would like to uh, get to know some software developers. I'm looking for a, uh, to modify my app. I have my app built in India, and now I need some changes to it. So, if you don't, if you're a freelancer online, or if you're here, please get in touch with me. If it's per hour or something, uh, by lunch, uh, help me fix something. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. You know what Hi everyone, I'm Joe. Uh, I work with Ray Green Networks and I'm one of the uh, co-runners of the AWS Michigan Meetup Group. We just uh, started running again back in June, so we're really trying to ramp that back up. Uh, our next event is December 1st in Ypsilanti, so uh, that's pretty cool. And just to really start really building the in-person meetup uh, community again, we launched a Discord, which is kind of be an analog for all that, called uh, Great Lakes Tech Leaders. So uh, what we're looking to do with that is do a lot of streaming of different meetups and things like that, and really bring all of the different meetups into uh, you know the same community there and have the same accessibility and all that good stuff. So I uh, hope to see you guys at the AWS Michigan Meetup or check out uh, the Discord at leaders.rbn.ai. I know that's probably a lot to remember, but um, it's cool. Check it out. Anything about the groups? Yeah. <laughs> I'm all the way live. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Hello, everyone. Yeah, so super, a little bit awkward. Uh, Cahoots is a co working space downtown Ann Arbor. Um, we actually have one of our anchor companies that has graduated from Cahoots at EAVX. I don't know if anybody's like familiar with them, uh, but they're moving to a larger facility where they can actually build out their vehicles. Um, which is really awesome. We're super proud of them, but we do have a lot of space opening up for um, startups and tech companies that are looking to, um, you know, bring their teams together or um, there's lots of like flex desk options. Um, we also have a happy hour coming up um, in December, December 15th. Um, it is kind of just going to be our end of the year holiday happy hour. So um, check that out. Cahoots, being Cahoots as our Instagram handle and Cahoots.com. Thank you. Any other community announcement? All right. All right well, with that, I want to thank everybody for making it out here, not the best weather. Uh, and again, let's give another round for our three presenters tonight. And we're going to hang out. Um, we've got a drink, food, obviously, here. And uh, get to know each other. That's what it's all about. And again, our next one will be on January 17th, 2023. So hope to see everybody for that. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. And for those online, I'm going to open up a, uh, a uh, breakout room for you guys to hang out for, for a bit. <laughs> Nice pitches. Oh, <laughs> you guys